I want to speak on the subject, being with Jesus in the wilderness. I spoke last week about being with Jesus on the mountain. We talked about how wonderful those experiences can be, whether they're planned or kind of impromptu, when we just have an encounter with Jesus like the disciples did on the mountain of transfiguration that we just have this moment that becomes definition for us in so many ways. Yet we also talked about how we're made and called and saved not to live on the mountain. We visit, but we're not meant to live there because that's not where the people are. The people are in the valley. And in this season leading up to the greatest moment in human history, Resurrection Sunday. We want to focus even more so on drawing closer to Jesus. So today I want to talk about being with him in the wilderness. Hebrews chapter 12, I'll begin reading in verse number one. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. My focus for this passage today is the beginning of verse number two, simply looking unto Jesus. So many things in our present world today provide every moment opportunities for distraction. So many things tell you they are what is the most important thing in life. Amen. Some will say there's nothing more important in life than providing for your family. Others will say there's nothing more important in life than being kind to others. Some will say being a person of good character is the most important thing in life. Many will also say being a responsible person, someone who can be counted on, a dependable person, is the most important thing in life. Now, don't get me wrong. All of these things are important. All of these things have their place. All of these things are qualities that we as God's people should exhibit far above anybody else, but they are not the most important thing in my life. The most important thing is looking unto Jesus. And going back to the original language for that phrase, we're not talking about just glancing his way. The original language would say looking closely and attentively. Some of your Bibles, depending on the translation you have, might read fixing your eyes on Jesus. Others might say keeping your eyes on Jesus. Looking anywhere else in life is looking the wrong way. We as God's people look unto Jesus. We keep our lives, we keep our, our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our intentions focused on him. We want to keep our lives, we want our lives to be fixed and focused and firmly looking to Jesus. And why? Because for the most part, for all of us, the direction you're looking in is the way you travel. That's how you go. I'm not looking to this world for direction for my life. Amen. I'm not looking to any political party for the direction of my life. Amen. I'm not looking to any nation, as much as I love the one that I'm a, a citizen of, for direction in my life. And I am certainly not looking to social media for direction in my life. Amen. We need to be looking to Jesus. I'm not focused and fixed on the current economic problems of our world. I'm not focused or fixed on the current situation in Eastern Europe. I'm not fixed on the price of gasoline at the moment, although it's going high, it may 
go up and down. I'm not fixed on who is in the White House because I know who is still on the throne no matter who was on any level of government here. Now, I do look and watch these things. I remain involved so I can understand how these things may impact the world we live in and how they may impact people I care about. But none of these things represents my joy. None of these things represents my peace. And none of these things represents my hope. I need to restate, I'm not and nor will ever will I advocate Christians sticking their heads in the sand and avoid dealing with the world and the people around them. Because remember, the people around us is why we're still here. If God didn't have a purpose for you and the people around you, you'd be gone now. But we are still here, which means God has plans for you. That can make you shout amen or that can make you go, oh my. (laughs) But God's got plans for you. We need to understand the times we live in. We need to discern the days that we're a part of. We need to be relevant in this day. But for joy, for peace, for hope, I'm looking to Jesus. And today I want to look to him. Of all the many roles or offices or ways he's described in both the Old and New Testament, I want to focus on three today. Jesus as our faithful prophet. Jesus as our high priest. And then Jesus as our great physician. Jesus is our faithful prophet. Now, in the Old Testament, when God sent prophets, they received a word from God either for a nation or an individual. And when it was an individual, it was usually a king. And that word would usually address the selfish ways of the people or the rebellious ways of the people or the king. It would also address usually the selfish or rebellious ways of the people of God. One exception would be the book of Jonah, where the prophecy came for the people of Nineveh. We could use a faithful prophet today. The church could use a faithful prophet today. The church could use someone to tell us to turn back from being more aligned with politics than with the gospel today. Prophets would tell people that they need to get more in line with what God wants to do than what the people around them are trying to do. Now, prophets not only told them about their rebellious ways, which was the present or the past, but prophets also let them know what was coming and what was in store. Most of you know the verse. Jeremiah chapter 28, uh, 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. This is a wonderful verse from Scripture. Most Christians know this verse. In fact, I'm sure many people at home have a mug, T-shirt, or plaque with this verse on it. It's very uplifting. It's a verse that provides hope for God's people. But I wonder, in focusing on verse 11, in this chapter of Jeremiah 29, how many people read the first 10 verses of Jeremiah 29? Because you see, in the first 10 verses, God says in verse 4, you're going to, you and the whole people are going into captivity. And oh, by the way, I did it. I put you in captivity because of your sinfulness. He tells them to go into Babylon who you're going into captivity with, and to build houses, and to create lives, and to be at peace. And being at peace as a part of the people of God in Babylon was no small task. And you're going to be there for a while. Well, how long, Lord? A week? A month? A year? Maybe five years. You're going to be there 70 years. Now, if God said, I'm going to send you to a real difficult situation, you're going to be captive. You'll be slaves of another nation, and you'll be there 70 years. It's then that he says, but take heart, because I know the thoughts I have for you. 
Oh, and if anybody comes in that 70 years and says, it's going to be over soon. Verse number 8 of Jeremiah 29. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or your diviners who are in the midst of you deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for the, they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work towards you and cause you to return to this place. Then he says, for I know the thoughts I have toward you, not evil, thoughts of peace to give you a future. Today, Jesus is our faithful prophet. So many people have asked me because of the situations in our world, when will it end? When Jesus says, it really is that simple. When he says it will end. In the meantime, I need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. He reveals the places where we fall short. He reminds me that no matter what I go through, he alone is the Lord of all creation. He calls his people not just to stop sinning, but to then turn in repentance and start doing the things we were called to do and saved to do. Amen. He informs us that we have a journey ahead of us and that no matter what becomes of this world, no matter what this world does, we can always say, God has been good to me. And because God has been good to me, God will be good to me. Amen. And he will always be in our midst. He, we will never be alone. Church, Jesus is our faithful prophet. Amen. And the church needs a prophet today. He is also our high priest. Now, the high priest would enter the tabernacle once a year to bring the sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. But no longer, because Jesus is our high priest. And the book of Hebrews makes it clear, we have an amazing high priest. He provided himself as the once for all sacrifice. No ritual is any um, longer needed. We have a once in a time sacrifice. No longer was the blood of animals needed. No longer was an annual ritual required. Jesus paid it all, and he paid it all for all of your sins. But pastor, you don't know what I've done, but Jesus does, and he paid the price for all of your sins. And by this sacrifice, because of it, he is now seated, Hebrews says, at the right hand of God, interceding for you. Think about that. He's interceding for you. Thank you Lord. I am grateful for the gift of the body of Christ. I can't express in words enough what it means to me that every single Tuesday as I board the Long Island Railroad that people in this church are praying for my well-being and safety. And just as a heads up, you'll need to do that twice a week coming up soon. As much as I'm grateful for that, it's beyond comforting to know that Jesus is praying for me. He's interceding for me. Whatever your situation, whatever you're going through, whatever you're feeling, whatever season, whether it be a season of joy, a season of turmoil, a season of economic difficulty, a season of grief, Jesus is interceding on your behalf. Jesus wants to bring you peace. He wants to bring you hope. And he wants you to know, as I said before, he's got plans for you. And they are plans covered in his blood, sacrificed at Calvary. He is our high priest. Jesus is also our great physician. He is our healer. Now, I may be wrong. It's possible. But I'm certain I don't know anybody who really enjoys being sick. I don't know anybody who enjoys it. When they start getting sniffles, they go, thank you, Jesus. 
or they get a fever of 101, my prayers have been answered. I don't know anybody who talks like that. No one likes being sick. We want to function at our best. We like to be at our most productive self. Not just to be able to produce or to accomplish, but we want to be at our best so that we can enjoy life with the fullest of who we are. We believe in the abundant life that Jesus came to give us, and Jesus wants that for you as well. It is always proper. It is always right to seek God for healing in your life. And some are going to say, but what if God doesn't want to heal you because he's got some other plan and it's part of a greater thing he's doing in your life? Then guess what? It won't work. You won't get healed. But you can always still pray that, Lord, come into my life and heal or reveal to me what it is you're doing. Pray for his healing power to flow in your life. But we get so fixated in our country, especially on physical healing. And there are so many people that I know who would be served detrimentally by being healed physically when they've got so much emotionally going on. So how about emotional healing? How about relationship healing? So many people have issues in their lives with people that they haven't spoken to in 20 years. But what happened? I don't remember. Then guess what? It's time to let God heal that relationship. I don't remember what it was, but I know it was important. How important can it be if you can't remember it? And how about spiritual healing? So many have been hurt in different situations related to their part or being part of the body of Christ. But I'm here to tell you, God's people may not be perfect, but we serve a God who is. Whatever it is you need from Jesus, whatever ill you're dealing with, God is here to heal you. Amen. He is our great physician. Amen. Now, focusing on the roles, whether it be faithful prophet or high priest or great physician, is good in our everyday lives. But how about in those times when you feel far away from the Lord? Those seasons when you seem to have a difficulty hearing his voice. Those wilderness times. Aren't you glad you serve a savior who's got some experience in the wilderness? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Let's make something clear about the wilderness. This was God's design. It was God's design. He was led by the Spirit in the wil- into the wilderness. Verse number 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. No kidding. Usually I go a couple of hours and I'm feeling it. Verse 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Satan tempted Jesus the same way he tempts you and me. The same way he tempted Adam in the Garden of Eden. He brought questions. Did God really say that? Does God really mean that? He tried to create doubt in the situation 
And if he couldn't create down, or once he created down, he wanted Adam to know at least, I don't know if God's got your best interests at heart. Is God doing right by you? Basically, he was trying to say to Adam, and he was trying to say to Jesus, I've got a better option for you. And he says that to us each and every day. But he will never be the better option. He needs to not even be any option. We're looking unto Jesus today. If you are the son of God, he says, command these stones become bread. First of all, devil really, if he is the son of God, there's no if involved here. And how did Jesus answer him? With the word of almighty God. That's why we need to know it, because that's the answer to temptation, the word of almighty God. Next, if you are the son of God, throw down yourself off this high place, and God will save you. Again, if... No, no if. Jesus is the Son of God. Devil. The power of God is not for dumb carnival tricks. We believe God will protect us. We believe God will be our caretaker. And part of being our caretaker is giving us the wisdom to not get involved in dumb things. And again, the answer once again was the word of God. I believe every single Tuesday now that I've been going into Manhattan that God will take care of me. But guess what? I check where I'm going. I make sure who's around me. I am aware of my surroundings. And I leave the rest to God. Well, I believe God will take care of me. So I'm just going to detour from my normal routine and go someplace dangerous. Mm Mm-hmm. You better have spoken to God first. And next, the devil said, I'll give you the world if you fall down and worship me. At least the devil was wising up by the third temptation. He stopped saying if. He recognized who he was talking to. And I want you to understand that you need to understand today that when the devil comes your way, who he is talking to. He is talking to a child of God. He is talking to a son or daughter of the Most High. And he wants you to reduce yourself, to diminish yourself, to lower yourself before him. So when the devil comes your way, remind him of who he's speaking to. He is speaking to a daughter or son of the king. He is addressing someone who will rule and reign with Jesus one day. And again, Jesus answered with the word of almighty God and basically said, you know, I'm done talking to you away. How do we navigate wilderness times? We remember we have a faithful prophet. We have a high priest and a great physician and we remember his word. And church, remember who you are. First John chapter 4, verse 4. Another verse I'm sure is on plaques, mugs, and t-shirts. You are of God, little children, and overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. There isn't anything the devil can do to me that matters. I serve a risen Savior today. And that's where this message began, looking to Jesus. Beloved, no matter what season you are in, no matter what season our world is in, no matter what season human history is in, no matter how close we are or aren't to his coming, measured by human standards, my advice is the same. Pastor, what do we do? The Lord be coming back soon. Look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. Well, I'm not sure if he's coming back soon. Same advice. Look unto Jesus. I'm not sure if he'll come back in my lifetime. Well, then one day you're going to die. So look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's where we began. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher 
of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. How did Jesus make it? He remembered why he was here and where he was going. The joy set before him. Now, I'm no prophet, so don't go stoning me if I'm wrong. But things in our country right now are pretty messed up. Okay, for that I'll be a prophet. Because that was an easy one. And I see so many believers, so many Christians especially, up in arms at the way things have changed, and rightly so. It's not what our nation was founded on. There are things that have just gone in a very different direction. And they're up in arms and giving tremendous amounts of energy, or at least tremendous amounts of social media energy, to what we can do about it and how we must fight against it. But consider this. What if, like Israel going into captivity with Babylon, what if this is part of a plan? What if this is part of what's going to lead up to these end things? I'm not saying don't fight for our rights. But understand, my rights in this nation are not where my joy, peace, and hope reside. They, they reside in looking unto Jesus. The joy set before him. You know, we look to Resurrection Sunday, but Good Friday had to happen first. That whole ordeal of torture and pain, of suffering, of injustice, all for you and me. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. It's pretty hostile out there, isn't it? It can be discouraging. And we can get easily despised. You Christians don't know what you're talking about. You keep looking like there's a better world coming. No, not like there is a better world coming. Amen. There is a kingdom coming Amen. whose builder is Jesus. So when these things happen, looking unto Jesus. Again, I'm not ignoring the nonsense that goes on around us, and it's nonsense. I'm not ignoring how much wrong is called right today. I'm not ignoring the evil that is legislated as proper today. I'm not ignoring any of that. But if you study history at all, the truth is none of it compares to what went on in Babylon. None of it. And none of it compares to what went on in first century Rome. And in Babylon, the Lord said, you're going to be there for a while, seven decades, but don't lose heart because I've got plans for you. I've got a future for you. God is going to take care of you. God is going to provide for you. God is going to be there and bring comfort and joy even in the midst of sorrow. We have one task in all of this, looking unto Jesus. He is the author and finisher of my faith. Being an American citizen is not the author and finisher of my faith. But Jesus is. Jesus is. You know, I, I was looking uh, yesterday while I was here because I had wanted to be able to share information with you about what the Church of God, our denomination, is doing in Ukraine. And I'm going to call the Church of God World Missions Department tomorrow and first say, I found some information, but man, y'all hit it real, real well. Uh, so I got to talk to him about that. And it talked about a missions, a, a fundraising project, and I have a project number that we can send to help the people in Ukraine, but it just struck me that the Church of God has over 100 churches in Ukraine. 
and that they're all suffering right now. Amen. They're all in turmoil right now. Many of those churches, those churches have become bomb shelters and have been bombed. And they're looking unto Jesus. That's what their greatest need is. Yes, it would be great if the assault would stop. It would be great if Putin woke up. It would be great for all of these things to happen. But their greatest need is to keep looking unto Jesus. And it's our greatest need too. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Stand with me, please.